Okay, so this is Dr. Krauss with the last advanced Python module. I want to talk about OpenPy Excel. Um, looking back on it, this is actually, I think, a pretty powerful and pretty good example, even if it's short. Um, and maybe I should have used this to sell your interest in Python earlier on. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. But it's basically related to my story. Um, so I finished my master's degree and went to the automotive industry for three and a half years before I started my PhD. At that time, um, I didn't really know Python yet. Um, I don't know what stage Python was in its development in 1998. Um, in the automotive industry, in the, the company that I worked for had a few MATLAB licenses, but they were kind of unofficially reserved for people in advanced engineering, which was not me. Um, and so it was kind of a hassle to be able to check out a MATLAB license. Um, but I needed to write some kind of programs to analyze some of the experimental data we were generating from various tests. Um, and everyone, I mean, this is kind of true, I think, of most American companies, but everyone in the company had access to Excel. So what I did was teach myself how to write fairly powerful and fairly complex macros in the VBA programming language um, to interact with Excel spreadsheets that contained data. Um, and I think this was cool, I think this was good, I think this was powerful, um, but it's it's not a super easy language to learn, and it was just kind of, there was a lot of time there spent creating some of my own utilities and things. Um, so I feel like this situation is relatively common in the workplace. Excel is a given, and everyone is at least minimally familiar with it. VBA is powerful, but I do feel like you could do some really, really powerful things if you could use a Python on Excel spreadsheets. Um, and there are multiple tools available to work with this. Um, and if you're someone who's kind of serious about programming, um, that might not be typical of a lot of companies. Um, and so if you could share your results in Excel when you're done, you could be seen as a valuable team player. Conversely, if you try to tell all your coworkers they need to learn Python or even just install Python, um, you might get a lot of pushback on that. And yeah, so I, being able to use Python with Excel or use Excel to show Python results or take other people's Excel spreadsheets, do some powerful stuff in the background in Python and then output that result to Excel, I think could have really good uh, implications for your career. So that's where I'm trying to go with this. Um, so this is a relative, I'm not the only person who thinks this. This is a relatively common problem among Python enthusiasts, at least. Um, maybe that's a small group. Um, so there are some different tools available to you. Um, some tools are very much specific to Windows only. So if you're in Windows running Microsoft Office, that's a really common scenario. And there are lots of people who want to use Python in that scenario. And so PyWin32 um, might provide you with some really powerful options. And I just found a, a discussion of that on a Stack Overflow thread um, that might be worth looking into. Um, for a long time, I used Excel Read or XLRD, uh, but it only works with the old style XLS files, which are now pretty old. Um, I think XLS X has been around since, I don't know, at least 2010, a number of years, and is now essentially a standard format. Um, and so if you can't work on SLX files, it's kind of limited. Uh, but the Excel Read, if you really did have some old files laying around and you needed to be able to access them, Excel Read allows you to do that. Um, I just came across this morning, just kind of Googling Python Excel tools or something, a project called Excel Wings. Um, and it seems like they're setting out to actually do what I did as far as macro writing, but do it all in Python. So you would replace VBA entirely. And in my mind, that would be crazy powerful. But... Um, Seems like it's pretty new software. It might be working. It might have a lot of bugs. Who knows? Uh, so I have not played with that. Uh, just be warned. It could be super crazy powerful and it could be really painful to run into a bunch of bugs. I don't know. Uh, so the main tool that I'm going to talk about is OpenPy Excel, which allows you to read and write XLSX files from Python cross-platform and it seems to work pretty well in my opinion and you'll probably need to install it via pip so if you just did a pip install openpyxl 
good things should happen for you. Um, so one, I kind of wrote my, I just, um, it looks like as I look at my own code that I needed, I had some kind of um, class list. I don't know, might frighten you, might not surprise you at all to learn that I like to use Python for spreadsheets for my grades and compiling grades and computing grades and all that kind of stuff. Um, one of those things that probably would be easier to just kind of do in more traditional ways by just working with spreadsheets, but I prefer to do Python programming rather than other stuff. And so this just allows me to do that. So the, my code is partially, like I see in there, there's a hard code that I'm looking for last name and first name. And so that's probably indicative of a grade spreadsheet. Um, but there are a couple of Mac, so this is not in the, the advanced Python, but in my own, so if you just went to uh, my GitHub page, under my repository, so there's this advanced Python that we've been in for a while, but this is just in the Kraus misc, and this is just random code that I use for various purposes, and SLX utils has this code. And some of it has to do with getting uh, just data in and out of these Excel formats. Um, for example, one of the things we'll talk about is obviously in a CSV file, you may not know this, but it really can only save text. So it doesn't make any sense for it to try to save some kind of formula like you would use in a spreadsheet. Whereas if you're loading an actual SLX, SLSX file, there's obviously formulas in there. And so how do you deal with those things? Um, and so it's just a little bit more complicated in some ways than doing CSV, where in CSV you just have strings that are either floating point or something else, and you just gotta deal with it. So I wrote a lot of my own code that's kind of driven by, I kind of want to treat SLXX files as CSV files, which is maybe a bad idea, but that's where I'm headed. Um, and so the two main functions, I just want to take everything that's in one sheet of an S XLSX file and convert it into a Python list that I can then manipulate. And so this one takes a file name and assumes you just want the first sheet. Obviously, one of the ways that an SLSX file is much more powerful than a CSV files, you can have multiple sheets. And so that's going to get a little weird. Um, so I'm just hard coding. I want the zero width sheet. Um, and then I use this uh, uh, utility file that I have called get all data. And one of the things that was tricky is um, Pi, OpenPy Excel will tell you how many rows are in the sheet, but sometimes formatting makes cells that actually are empty look as if they're not. And so I go through here and I just look for the first, I, I assume that I start in the, the upper left, I guess it'd be like an A1, I think, is the column, or sorry, the A, the zeroth row of the, or the first row of the A column, or, ah, A row, or, I can't, the first column of the A row, I think that's how that works. And then go down until you find a completely empty row. And the first completely empty row is considered to be the end of where the data in the spreadsheet is read all of that into a list. So a completely blank line in the middle would totally screw up my code. Be aware of that and maybe make it look for more than one empty row or something. Um, but get all data takes an open Pi Excel sheet instance and takes all of the rows, tries to format the cells as best it can and loads them into a list. So we'll do a demo of that uh, maybe right now. Um, so I do have an advanced Python, um, open Pi Excel part of this that's underneath advanced Python. And so I've got this demo that will, I've got a test workbook, what I'll show you, and we'll read that test workbook in. And then this will get created. I probably should have left that out of the repository. And this is the Python code that creates this workbook. So now let's do those things. So first of all, um, this is the test workbook that I created in Excel. And so similar to the CSV files we've been talking about, I've got some kind of header information up here at the top in these three rows. Sorry, I guess I showed that I haven't really thought in uh, spreadsheets in a while I do everything in Python. So apparently the letters are the columns and the numbers are the rows. Um, and then I've got some labels and then I've got some data. And so these are actual floating point values, and then these are formulas to create a sine wave, a specifically a one hertz sine wave, two pi times t. So you can see how that's working. 
or maybe you can't because I'm so zoomed out. Um, let's do that. Now hopefully you can see how I'm working. So again, I've got some header information, I've got some data column labels, I've got a column of floating point values, and then I've got my formulas. So over here in my read demo, I'm just calling this function from my SLX utils. And the first thing, so one of the big hangups in this is how do you handle the formulas? Obviously formulas in a spreadsheet are super powerful and kind of complicated. And if you're writing a spreadsheet program such as Excel or the OpenOffice Calc or whatever, how you deal with those formulas is really important. And the people who are doing this in Python don't really want to reinvent the wheel um, and so with uh, OpenPy Excel, you have two options. Data only means show me what was in the cell the last time um, it was actually viewed in a spreadsheet, which would cache a value that's actually, so do you wanna see these floating point numbers? That would be data only, or do you wanna see these formulas? And so if you don't specify data only, you're gonna get these formulas, which might be a little weird. Um, so the one thing that I could see going wrong with this is if your cache was somehow out of date, C-A-C-H-E, I'm not asking for bribes. Um, I think you're relatively safe in that I don't know how someone would have changed the formula without also viewing the file. Maybe if you didn't save it when you were done, I don't know. Um, but know that data only just grabs the values that are somehow saved within the S XLSX cache system. Whereas um, if you don't do data only, you'll actually get the formulas back. So let's find a, so if I said run my read demo, you note that I've defined data one and data two. So data one does not have data only. And so what gets returned I convert these successfully to floating point numbers, but these are just strings representing the formulas that lead to the calculation of the Y values. Whereas data two has floating point values of the formulas being evaluated based on what's in the data cache. So just know that that's available. Um, if you want to look in a little bit more detail at my code, so the get all data from file name takes a file name, a sheet index, Verbosity is for printing out kind of debugging messages. And then the main thing besides the file name is this data only flag. Do you want data only or do you want not? Do you want floating point numbers or do you want formulas essentially? And so we use OpenPy Excel load workbook. We get the list of sheet names. If there's more than one sheet, we just kind of throw out a warning that says, by the way, we're ignoring other sheets in this file. And then I get the first sheet by using sheet index. Um, maybe I didn't know how to do it, or maybe OpenPy Excel doesn't allow you to simply get a sheet by an index number. But we're taking sheet names of zero and getting that sheet by name. So maybe you've never noticed that at the bottom of Excel spreadsheets, there's these different sheets. And this one only happens to have one sheet. But if there were more, you would see them here. Maybe that's really basic, I have no idea. And then I call get all data passing in this sheet. And so get all data starts in row zero, has a big list that's gonna be sort of like we had been talking about in CSV files. It'll end up being a list of lists where each row will have its own list. And so, I, so N is the, the number of rows that the sheet thinks it has. But like I said, there may be blank rows due to formatting that still show up in that list of rows. So I iterate from I going from zero to N, asking for that row of the sheet. And then I check, is that row empty? And you can look at my function for empty row checker. Um, if I could find that function. So, hmm, <laughs> that seems slightly suspicious to me, but I've hard coded that I'm gonna check the first three columns. I guess what I'm saying is if the first three columns are blank, then anything else out to the right of, oh, I can maybe see why I did this. So sometimes what I'm doing, so again, this all falls back to me in the paradigm of using grade sheets um, sometimes I've got, you know, like a, a last name and a first name and then who knows what else. 
And then sometimes at the bottom of the sheet, I'm calculating the averages for each homework assignment or each quiz or whatever. And I don't want that row to be considered as far as where does the data end. Um, and so the average row wouldn't have a last name or a first name. And I don't know what the third column would be. So I'm only checking, because of this slightly dangerous looking semi-hard code, I'm only checking the first three columns. And if the first three columns of a row are blank, um, then it's blank. Then the row is actually blank. OK, sorry, that was, I think, a little bit confusing. So just to clarify, I'm checking the first three cells. I think I said columns earlier. The first three cells of the row. And if the internal value of the first, you know, the 0, 1, and 2 indexed cell of the row, if any of those internal values is not none, then the row is not blank. If we make it through all of this without returning false, then the first three cells of the row had an internal value of none, and the row is considered blank. OK. So for each row, I'm checking to see if the row is empty. If the row is empty, I simply break out of the for loop, which then says we're done putting data in, data out. If the row is not empty, I get the values for each row. Um, and I then I try to encode those values. And I try to clean up the strings. And I append the output data. And so if you wanted to know more about the details of this, um, apparently that's pretty simple. Simply get item.value. And that must be something, I mean, so in some ways, a spreadsheet, if you start to think about all the details that would go into creating your own spreadsheet file, there's a lot going on there. And so a cell could have different formatting information, it could have a formula, it could have so on and so forth. And so item.value must refer to the value property of a cell, which is a row would be a list of the cells of the row. Um, and then, like I said, I try to encode the values. And so this had to do with, um, You know, is it coming in as a Unicode string? Then I could try to encode it as ASCII, um, yada, yada, yada. And then I've hard-coded a very specific date-time format. If it comes in as a date-time instance, um, that could be dangerous if you didn't use month slash day slash year, so on and so forth. And then I try to clean those strings. And somewhere in there must be... Um, I don't know. Um, somehow there's also handling floats and longs. And so I don't know what's coming out of there. Um, so all that to say, if you use my helper module, and as long as you don't have any blank rows in your spreadsheets, this can work. And the main question you got to ask yourself is, do I want data only or do I want formulas? Okay, moving on, let's talk about creating a spreadsheet where I think this could be really, really powerful is if you had somehow read in some experimental data or something and you messed with it in Python and created some kind of meaningful output and you wanted to dump that data to an Excel file. So I'm importing workbook from OpenPy Excel. I'm creating a workbook instance. I've got a specified file name that I want to use. I get the active sheet. I name that sheet. And so for example, I've got some T and Y data that I want to dump to a file. So my sheet has an append that would take a list that would be one row. And so that's going to go in the first or zero with row of the active spreadsheet. And then I create my data and set it up as a matrix where T is the first column and Y is the second column. And you might not know that every NumPy array has a two list method. I tried doing this without two list and even though um, NumPy arrays support iteration in a for loop. Um, OpenPy Excel didn't know how to append an ND array because each row of an array is still an array. A 2D array has 1D arrays as its, um, as its rows. But if you just convert it to a list, then any Python function that can deal with lists gets a list of whatever. So this is a list of floating point values. So for each row in the data as a list, 
I'm appending that to the spreadsheet and then I um, create a sheet and I give that sheet title hello and then I go to specific um, cells using the column row format that would be typical of the formulas of most spreadsheet programs and I send in a floating point number and a string and then I save it. So let me um, first of all make sure that no sheets are open um, and then let me remove the created book so you can see that it wasn't there and then I'm going to come over here and run the create demo and now created book is there uh, and open is Mac specific don't try that on your uh, Raspberry Pi um, so if I zoom in on this a little bit you can see that here so I said I wanted to have my first sheet be called saved array and I was putting T and Y and then outputting the data and so here's a T here's a Y and then these are floating point values that have been written to the cells in the spreadsheet. Um, and then I also created this other sheet entitled hello. And I specifically put 1.1234 in B5. And again, let me zoom in on that. And so there's B5 with a floating point number of 1.1234. And here is C3 with a string of hello. So we correctly took some stuff that we had created in Python and saved it to an SLSX file that Excel was able to open without a problem. So I think that's powerful. And then again over here, I took an, an existing Excel X, X, XLSX file and read it into Python where I could then work with it as a list and decide later how to output it. So I think that could be really powerful in terms of using Python in a workplace where not everyone is a computer programmer or even has very good coding skills, but is just comfortable with spreadsheets. I think you could still fit in there, do powerful things, make yourself a valuable employee, but you're using Python in the background. Thanks.